This 2016 election cycle has revealed much beauty about the possibility of America, but it's also revealed tremendous ugliness about America as well. I want everybody in this room to think about the racial tensions that have erupted, the likes of which I have not seen in my lifetime. And now, I'm fairly confident that the racial insensitivity we all just considered was not anti-Semitism. But that's exactly what I'd like to speak about today, is the insensitivity directed at us and our national homeland, the state of Israel. As a rabbi, a Jew, a father of three Jewish children, one of the most worrisome revelations of this election cycle is the wave of open and socially acceptable, ugly, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel rhetoric and plain bullying pervading this great country of ours. In the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, there appeared a story on May 9th, 2016, about a freshman at Stanford University named Madeline Chang. Curious why all her friends were so divided, she decided to attend a student government meeting about sanctions against the state of Israel. The title of the Haaretz article is, and I quote from the BDS front lines, how the on-campus brawl is turning young Jews off Israel. In the article, Chang tries to explain, and I quote, literally all my Jewish friends were sitting on one side of the room, and all my other friends, most of whom look much more like me, were on the other. She recalls describing the scene she encountered last year upon entering the rowdy auditorium hall. On each side, people were waving and begging me to join them, and I felt totally paralyzed." End of quote. The article also describes a UC Davis junior, Zoe Rabinow, whose mother is Jewish. The article quotes Rabinow as saying, and I quote, whenever BDS comes up, it's like, why is this even an issue for discussion when most people have no idea what they're talking about? Asked the neurobiology major, who describes herself as a mixed feelings kind of person. End of quote. The article goes on, and I quote, even in California, the epicenter of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS movement against Israel, many Jewish students say they have yet to form an opinion on whether they endorse a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that involves one state, two states, or no states at all. End of quote. No state at all. No state at all? I had to read those words over and over to believe what my eyes were reading. No state at all. Are these California Jewish students, in the article, so self-absorbed, so preoccupied with their own social standing, that they can't risk publicly supporting the state of Israel, its right to exist at all? Many of us know in this room about UC Berkeley's course titled, Palestine, a Settler Colonial Analysis. Through the Ethnic Studies Department, a senior by the name of Paul Hadwa proposed a graduate student-led course to, and I quote, explore the possibilities of a decolonialized Palestine, end of quote, meaning to say to explore the possibility of a region without the state of Israel. To receive the single credit students are supposed to present, and I quote, researched, formulated, and presented decolonial alternatives to the current situation, end of quote. The LA Times reported two weeks ago on September 19th, the class was suspended after one session for review, and I quote, following a storm of criticism that had fostered anti-Semitism and indoctrinated students against the Jewish state, end of quote. The suspension has now been lifted and classes have now resumed at Berkeley. The LA Times explains that Paul Hadwa, and I quote, called the revisions he made in consultation with ethnic studies faculty members cosmetic. There were no substantive changes, said Hadwa 22, who is majoring in peace and conflict studies. It was not the revisions that allowed the course to get approved. 
It was the pressure from people across the globe. We are once again facing forces against the Jewish people. Forces that have existed for thousands of years. In our Tehillim, Psalm 137, we read the famous words, Im eshkechach Yerushalayim tishkach yimini. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let me forget my right hand. I'm not sure if any of us have ever visited a non-industrialized country, but if you think your right hand or your good hand, your strong hand, is important now to you, then just wait and see how important it is in the non-industrialized country, and you might begin to understand the sentiment of the writer of the psalm. The psalmist tries to express an instinctive sense that Jerusalem, that Israel, is so integral, so essential to the makeup of our DNA as Jews, that simply put, we cannot live without that piece of land. In an election year, choosing is about priorities. I would hope that most people in this room share concern about Israel and share concerns about the American economy and share concerns about social issues and also about international affairs all across the globe. Choosing for whom to vote is about prioritizing those issues. I will not endorse a candidate, but I take this most valuable time during the high holidays to encourage you to not undervalue the state of Israel in your list of priorities. At this point, anti-Israel decisions in the UN are expected. Anti-Semitism in Europe and abroad is expected. But for the first time, I stand here concerned about the United States of America. The New York Times reported on August 3rd that Dr. Joy Carrigo, an assistant professor at Oberlin College in Ohio, was placed on paid leave after she posted on social media that the CIA and Mossad were funding ISIS. She wrote that the Mossad was behind the killings in Paris at Charlie Hebdo. And she wrote that Israel shot down the Malaysia Airlines plane in 2014. All of her claims are obviously false. But note, that's a PhD in academic achievement on paid leave. I just want to repeat that, paid leave. No amount of education or knowledge or academic achievement can cure good old-fashioned Jew hatred. You see, the anti-Israel efforts on college campuses haven't yet impacted Israel's economy through boycott, divestment, and sanctions yet, thank God. We've stopped the effects of Israel through state and federal legislation and through organizational initiatives. However, the anti-Israel efforts on college campuses do succeed at marginalizing Jewish students. It takes the most unique, miraculous event of the 20th century, the founding of the State of Israel, and turns that into a family tragedy for which we should be shameful. I refuse to be ashamed. Anti-Semitism is growing in the United States. The words are not new. The images are not new. The source of the most effective anti-Semitic smearing, the source is new. Because the source of the most effective anti-Semitic smearing going on in the United States today is done by left-wing liberal activists. It's found a warm home on college campuses but it's already metastasized through liberal America today. Sefi Kogan, a fellow youth delegate of mine for the Merkaz party at the World Zionist Congress last year, now the assistant director of campus affairs for the American Jewish Committee. He wrote an article in the foreword titled, How BDS is Pushing Jewish Students Out of Social Justice Activism. In it he wrote, and I quote, Today, to be a social justice advocate of any kind on many US college campuses requires a sort of litmus test. Do you want to fight the epidemic of campus sexual assault? 
good, but you must also support BDS. And if you believe that women on US college campuses shouldn't fear rape each time they venture out at night, but don't want to sign on to an anti-Israel agenda, you might, you might just find yourself pushed out of the sexual violence advocacy arena altogether. As one student attendee at the AJC Global Forum 2016 put it, I want to be a part of the progressive fights my generation is currently waging. But I am deeply troubled and challenged by the anti-Israel sentiment rising amongst the far left. End of quote. Recently, in late August, the Graduate Student Association president at UCLA, Milan Chatterjee, resigned his position after a protracted battle over his refusal to agree to fund events that were anti-Israel or pro-Israel. He claimed that politics over Israel had no place in the Graduate Student Association budget at UCLA. Students for Justice in Palestine, Palestine Legal, and the ACLU investigated Chatterjee and smeared his reputation until he simply resigned. His letter of resignation to UCLA Chancellor Block was published online, and he blamed the forces aligned with and behind BDS, and then he transferred to NYU Law School to finish his final year. On October 1st, this past Saturday's edition of the New York Times featured an article called Anti-Semitism at My University Hidden in Plain Sight, written by Benjamin Gladstone, a Jewish student, a junior at Brown University. As a student involved in liberal causes such as his presidency of the Brown Coalition for Syria that gives voice to the refugee crisis and involved in Jewish organizations at Brown as well, he claims that liberal causes and organizations at Brown would rather not have events than have events co-sponsored by Jewish organizations. Gladstone writes, my fellow activists tend to dismiss the anti-Semitism that students like me experience regularly here on campus. They don't acknowledge the swastikas that I see carved in bathroom stalls, scrawled across walls, or left on chalkboards. They don't hear students accusing me of killing Jesus. They don't notice professors glorifying anti-Semitic figures such as Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt or the leadership of Hezbollah as mine have." End of quote. I spoke earlier this summer about the growing Israel hatred of the American political left, including Max Blumenthal, whose father is an advisor to Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders' advisors, including Dr. James Zogby. We have been accustomed to anti-Semitism from the political far right, the KKK, the neo-Nazis, white supremacists. Just last week, Breitbart, a far right-wing internet site whose former chairman is now a top advisor for Donald Trump, Breitbart.com published an article criticizing a Washington Post columnist by the name of Ann Applebaum for her criticism of Donald Trump. These are the words of the Breitbart article. Hell hath no fury like a Polish Jewish American elitist scorned. End of quote. If you find that worrisome, if you find it troubling, go to the Breitbart article and see the comments under the article by proud American anti-Semites. I guarantee you it'll be terrifying. But now it's time to recognize anti-Semitism from the political left as well the Black Lives Matter movement platform, the BDS movement on college campuses, anti-colonial academia on college campuses, and most recently, the Green Party. This year, the Green Party nominated Jill Stein for President of the United States. And this is a direct quote from her website. I quote, the Jill Stein campaign calls for ending support for governments committing war crimes and massive human rights violations, including Israel and Saudi Arabia. It supports the BDS movement as a peaceful, nonviolent set of actions organized by civil society across the world, aimed to end Israeli apartheid, occupation, war crimes, and systematic human rights abuses. End of quote. I intend on being the rabbi here for a long time. So just so there's no miscommunication, I do not believe BDS is peaceful. And I don't believe Israel is engaged in apartheid, occupation, 
war crimes, or systematic human, abuse, human rights abuses. I do believe that Jill Stein only accuses two countries in the entire world of such crimes by name on her website. I do believe that in 2016, I have no problem identifying Jill Stein as an anti-Semite in spite of her Jewish heritage in which she grew up attending the Reform Synagogue in Chicago, North Shore Congregation Israel, where my in-laws and my entire, my entire wife's family belongs. I do believe Jill Stein is blinded by her hate of Israel because there is perhaps no greener country in the world for the Green Party candidate to emulate than the state of Israel and its amazing environmental policies. Some of you might be thinking, maybe the problem is Rabbi Leibovitz. <laughs> maybe, ra maybe the rabbi lacks the moral clarity. And not all these groups of social activists, racial activists, and environmental activists I stand here describing today. Maybe I should take them at their word that all they want is for Israeli policy to change. Perhaps that's the only reason that the political left here in America singles out Israel for such punishment. Six weeks ago, on August 31st, journalist Collier Meyerson tweeted out from an Air France flight that an ultra-Orthodox Jewish man who was supposed to sit next to her took a look at her clothing and refused to sit next to her. As a response to her tweet, liberal MSNBC host Chris Hayes responded to her, and I quote, perfect time to start a good Frank BDS conversation, end of quote. Now, what is the connection between an ultra-Orthodox Jew and BDS? Absolutely nothing. If we take boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel strictly as against Israeli political policy. No connection, unless, unless Chris Hayes sees BDS as a sanction not only against a strong Israel, but also as a slap against all strong Jewish identity as well. Hayes simply apologized and claimed that his tweet was a joke that was taken out of context. I have to be honest, I can't imagine an appropriate context for his remark. God forbid Hayes had made such a pithy joke about Muslims or African Americans. I assure you he would no longer be a host of a show on MSNBC. The truth, the God's honest truth, is that I wasn't planning on giving this sermon until a young woman walked into my office to interview for a job in our new religious school. I asked her where she went to school and she explained that she was forced to drop out of Vassar after she felt threatened, personally threatened, by the BDS movement. I couldn't believe it. Vassar? I thought Vassar was the most liberal, open, safe campus in America. Then I googled Vassar and BDS and found an article in the foreword called How Jewish Students Like Me Got Bullied at Vassar BDS Vote. It was all there. It described the bullying of Jewish students who try to support or give voice at all to the state of Israel on the Vassar campus. This is the new anti-Semitism in 2016 America. It comes from the far left and it tries to disguise itself as regarding only Israel. But we should recognize it as something old, something familiar, something I haven't had to face in my lifetime, and most of us in this room have not had to face in our lifetimes, something most of us have only heard about from our parents and our grandparents. What is the answer? How do we begin to correct this growing epidemic? Tshuva. But Rabbi, tshuva is done by the people who have committed missteps. We, our children, we're the victims. Friends, in 2016, I don't want to hear about Jewish victimhood anymore. We are in control of our own fate, thank goodness. Tshuva is a word 
from the root shuv, which means to return. And I invite you, starting today, let's return to the matter. I ask you, I implore you, to return to the matter of the state of Israel. At a time when Jewish students are saying they're not sure what the answer is, I can tell you that's because their parents and their community did not bring them to think about this subject before. Im eshkach Yerushalayim tishkach yimini. If you forget Jerusalem, you will forget your right hand. This is not the time to mince words with our children, our friends, our co-workers about Israel. If you care about Israel, this is the time to stand up and show it. I love hearing, I love hearing about the terrific vacations, all of the people I know. I watch on Facebook as my friends visit Australia and Europe and Mexico. If you don't prioritize Israel through your time and through your money, visiting Israel with your family, don't wonder why they don't feel a connection to prioritize Israel later in life. When you want to teach your kids to connect to synagogue, did you have your kids go on a teen trip to a synagogue? Of course not. You bring them and you explain to them why they have to sit here in synagogue. And they see you go and you sit there as well. For Israel, we pack up our kids and we send them on birthright and we expect that the tour guides will do our jobs. They don't. It's not enough. The Talmud tells us that the Romans destroyed the Holy Temple and then they banned all Jewish study. Rabbi Akiva refused to obey the Roman law and publicly taught Torah. Papas ben Judah came by and found Rabbi Akiva publicly teaching Torah. Papas asked him, Akiva, are you not afraid of the trend in society? Are you not afraid of the Roman government? Rabbi Akiva told him a parable. He said a fox was walking by a river and watched the fish furiously swim back and forth. The fox asked the fish in the water, from what are you fleeing? The fish answered, from the nets and traps that were put here by men. So the fox said to them, how would you like to come up on dry land and we'll live together in peace? The fish replied, you, the fox, the cleverest of animals, are in fact a fool. If we are fearful in the place where we have a chance to stay alive, to survive, how much more fearful should we be in a place where we have no chance to survive. Akiva said to Pappas, so it is with us. If we are fearful when we sit and study Torah, of which it is written, for that is your life and the length of your days, how much more fearful should we be if we stop studying Torah altogether? When Torah was banned, Jews became afraid, but it became all the more important for strong rabbis like Rabbi Akiva to stand publicly and teach Torah where everybody could see. We doubled down on our Torah study. When supporting Israel is being challenged at every level, at high schools, colleges, corporations, I say to you, if we are fearful of our kids supporting Israel in public, the answer is not to prioritize Israel lower so it doesn't draw attention to us. The answer is to stand publicly beside our children and support Israel together. Now we, the Jewish community in America in 2016, we have to double down our public support for the state of Israel. Adapting the words of Rabbi Akiva, how much more fearful should we be should we cease publicly supporting Israel altogether? This is the way in which we begin the conversation. Let's sit down with our children, with our family, with our friends, our coworkers, and begin a conversation by saying the following words. Israel is a non-negotiable part of our identity because, 
and then fill in the answer for yourself. Try it first with somebody you feel comfortable with. Israel is a non-negotiable part of our identity. O master of the universe, if we forget Israel, let us forget our right hand and our left. Let us stand with Israel alongside the rational, the clear-minded and level-headed, and let us use both hands to push back extremist hatred in this country from both sides. And let us say, Amen. Amen.